Well, everyone, hello. <clears throat> You're probably a bit confused because one, I'm dressed nice, and two, I'm not in front of my drawing tablet. In fact, I am in my classroom at Lorena High School. One of the perks of being a high school teacher that's in a school back in session is that I can be on campus and I can have access to my whiteboard. Now, normally I don't teach from here because normally I have students that like to cram in my classroom, especially the AP students. They ask lots of questions. And this is one of the rare times, I guess, because it's Monday that no one is here. So I thought, well, might as well finish up my lecture, post it, and yeah. So as I was saying last class is that we're on to ecology. And just to recap the definition of ecology, it is the interactions of how, or the study of how animals interact with their environment. And last lecture, I dazzled you about the story about the squirrels and the tail wagging, which shows you that we're still actually learning about how animals interact with each other. Pretty neat, huh? But anyways, when we study about ecology, and this is a different type of ecology called population ecology, is when we study things at the population level, What populations are is members of the same species, members of the same species in the same area. And whenever we study, whenever we, we, we study animals or groups of animals or even people, it's always best to do it at the population level in the same area. For example, if I want to study the average heights of antelope in both, um, I don't know, the northern, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, well, we know that the one thing that is the same, the one thing that is static, is the type of animal. And then the other things in the environment are the additional variables. So we usually include um, uh, we usually compare populations in order to, to make conclusions about how the environment affects them. Now, what are some of those variables? Well, we're gonna talk briefly about a community. We hear this term usually applied to people, but a community is, is life forms interacting with each other. Life forms interacting with each other. So for example, if I see a predator prey relationship, which is where one animal hunts another, we are focusing on the interaction between those two animals. Or if we see how a group of insects, um, they interact with a, a beaver dam, then again, we'll actually know that's, that's more, that's more of the, the ecosystem level. But okay, just to put it, to, to put it shortly, whenever we see two life forms interacting directly with each other that is considered a community. You could also compare things like competition, species um, uh, competing with each other for things like mates or the same resources. You can throw in things like um, mating behaviors between different species. So whenever we have, we have different life forms interacting with each other, we call that a, a community interaction. Um, yeah, kind of a funny story is that, is that one thing that some buildings do and some farmers do to prevent um, uh, things like pests from coming onto their property is to put like a fake scarecrow or a fake owl. Well, when I was teaching at St. Genevieve, and I don't know why I thought of this, but it's a funny story, kind of. We had a math teacher who was a nice old man um, at times, but he also was rather oblivious. Um, very smart man though. He actually taught at Los Angeles Harbor College too. But he, um, uh, yeah, he actually Googled all of his math exams. And he thought that, you know, he was pulling one over the students. Well, they figured out pretty fast he was, he was Googling the exams. They would find them, they would download them, they would uh, figure out the answers to, together. And this, this poor guy thought he was like the creme de la creme of math teachers because 
his students were acing the exams and he's like, wow, my, my students are so bright. And I'm like, yes, Mr. Gill, they're very bright students because they're figuring out how to Google and download your exams. But anyways, there is an owl on the roof and it was a fake owl, of course. I mean, in his defense, it was realistic looking, but the entire, but the entire year, apparently, uh, the students said that he would say, hey, there's our friend, friend the owl. And no one had the heart to tell them that the owl was not really an owl, but that's okay. Now, whenever we talk about broader interactions, we talk about it at the ecosystem level, which is mainly what we focus on. Because an ecosystem, ecosystem is life forms interacting with their environments. So this is the broader range of things. For example, water, for example, um, habitats, niches, um, things, like, things like a lizard going on a heat rock or things like a squirrel climbing a tree. I don't know why I've been, I'm just using squirrels, squirrels for everything. Or anything that involves animals interacting with the environment around them. So we call that an, an ecosystem. Um, an ecosystem, if you want the definition, it's basically, um, it's basically animals and the environment in a, in a specific area. There's really no boundary. Um, it doesn't like an ecosystem is from this boundary to this boundary. It's basically um, a defined area. So you can consider an ecosystem to be a, 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 a particular Forest, you can count this campus of, of the Reina High School as an ecosystem. So there's no defined boundary. The, the, the definition is based on the people. But right now, what we're going to talk about is population growth dynamics. Why is it that some species are extremely populous in an area, and in other areas, they're extremely sparse? Why is it that forests have an abundant amount of certain species, whereas deserts do not? And the study of this is population ecology. And the first thing that we are going to talk about here is we are going to talk about something called a population growth curve. So this is going to be the focus for the next um, 20 minutes or so. It's called the population growth curve. Population growth curve. And what this is, is that this is the growth rate, the growth rate of a certain species in a particular area. And it's going to be different for every area, and I'll explain why. So you aren't going to have the same, um, the same growth rate of reindeer in forest A as you will in forest B. And what this study does is it also shows you how populations in an area change over time. And that gives ecologists the opportunity to investigate what's happening in the environment so they can figure out why the population is changing. Unfortunately, humans tend to be the driving factor today of populations changing. That wasn't always that way. Once upon a time, this was a very um, vibrant field of study because you can see how things like changing weather or changing climate naturally, or things like the introduction of a new um, predator, the introduction of more prey, the prevalence of disease, you could see how, how that would affect um, population growth rates. But now it's mainly this answer is this humans, which is now turn into more environmental science. But anyways, uh, population growth is also largely determined by something called the carrying capacity. On the, on the graph, it's actually known as a K value. But we have the carrying capacity. What the carrying capacity is, is it is the maximum population, the maximum population that can be 
sustainably sustainably maintained in an area. Now notice how I said sustainably. And the term sustainable means can be maintained for an indefinite period of time. If it's sustainable, then it can be continued on for the, for the long term. Now, as we'll talk about carrying capacity can be exceeded, carrying capacity can also go up or it can go down. And what determines that is something called environmental resistance factors. I'm gonna go ahead and erase this. As you, as you guys can see, I have these fancy erasers I paid for myself. It actually came in a pack of 20. And when you're a 35 year old teacher, things like little, er little er erasers that you can fit together like puzzle pieces really makes you excited. So I've had these erasers for a couple of days now and I'm very excited. I figured out the most I can reasonably um, hold in one hand is four. Uh, I was able to do five for a bit, but fives is too much. My hands aren't big enough, unfortunately. If I could string six of those together, I could erase really fast. And those are things that when you're 35 and you're a teacher that make you really excited. Now, in every environment, there's something called resistance factors. So resistance factors. And these are things that oppose growth in a population. So they oppose growth. Now, if we didn't have the presence of resistance factors, species could continue in growth indefinitely. Uh, we actually have a term for that. We're not covering that in, in this chapter because it isn't in your, in your textbook. And I don't think it's, it's necessary for you to know it. But there's a term called biotic potential, which is, all right, you're to take a, a species, put it in an area, and give it unlimited resources, how fast could it grow? Well, it would eventually grow exponentially, but you can, you can imagine that a beetle uh, population could grow much faster than an elephant population, just because of re reproductive rates. But anyways, resistance factors, what they do is they oppose population growth. And here are the resistance factors. The first is the presence of clean water, or just water in general, because some species are water, are um, living water. So with, so with water, the more water. So um, let me see how to put this resistance factor. So, so we're going to say that these are factors that promote growth. So factors that promote growth. All right, so the more water present in an environment, the greater the population growth. And next, of course, is food. So I'm just gonna put down diet. And the more preferred food, the greater the population. Uh, the next one is going to be competition. And with competition, I'm just going to abbreviate it comp. With competition, the lower the competition, the higher the population growth. And this is competition for resources. With, with competition, it's members of the same or different species that are competing for the same resources. If you're a better competitor, you will get more of them. If you're a lesser competitor, you'll get less. And of course your population will be less. All right, next is going to be um, habitat availability. So I'm just going to put down habitats. And here, the greater the habitats, the higher the population that can be maintained. So there are plenty of places to live. There's plenty of places for members of a population to safely raise their young. 
All right, so next is, oh, also for diet, it also includes prey. Let me just, just go ahead and put that here too. Preferred food and prey, depending on the diet of the animal. Next, we have um, predators. So the fewer the predators, the higher the population can be, which kind of makes sense, right? If you don't have something hunting you constantly and trying to fit you into its stomach, then you're probably going to be able to thrive better in the environment. I don't think that's, I don't think I'm uh, going out on the limb here. I don't think too many of you are shocked when I say that. Okay. Next is going to be disease. And this is a big one. And I know with COVID-19 going on the past year, disease is something that is, that is definitely more uh, given more attention. But anyways, the less presence of disease, the higher the population. And okay, everyone, time for part two of our chapter 19 lecture. And adding to our list of environmental resistance factors, I'd like to also add in climate. Climate is another big one that we need to put in because of course, the better the climate, then the higher of a population can be maintained in a certain environment. So the next one we have is population size. No, not population size, what am I doing? So the last environmental resistance factor is going to be climate. And the more advantageous the climate, the higher the population can be supported. And different species prefer different types of environments. Okay, just the climate, then the higher the population. <clears throat> Animals generally like relative warmth and water, which is why areas that get lots of precipitation and lots of heat generally have the most, most species present. It's why the rainforest Tropical rainforest has over 50% of all the species on Earth. Of course, humans are doing a great job of trying to oppose that. But anyways, going back to what I was saying about disease, there was a very sad case that happened a couple of years ago. And yeah, it was a, it was a very sad case because Animal Planet was actually tracking a um, a species of antelope called the saiga antelope. And let me go ahead and try and find a video on it. But yeah, very, very sad uh, because they basically all just died. And right in front of them as they were filming. And it turned out that it was actually caused by a bacterial infection. Um, let me go ahead and uh, find you a video on that. Mm. Yeah, very sad. Uh, all right, let me go ahead and share this with you here. Speed it up just a tiny bit. These researchers have been on the go for days, looking for saigas across the vast grasslands of the Kazakh steppe. The protected area is as large as France. After the devastating mass die-off last year, there are a mere 33,000 saiga antelopes left. It happened during the calving season. Here alone, in the largest saiga population, more than 200,000 animals died, 90% wiped out in a matter of days. 5,000 animals are buried under this hill. Conservationist Stefan Suter from the Frankfurt Zoological Society and British antelope specialist Richard Koch want to find out why so many animals died. We've known about this bacteria for some time and the disease it causes is hemorrhagic septicemia. And the name itself, I think, says it all. It's a very nasty, fatal uh, infection. The scientists have found out that it's caused by pastorella bacteria and leads to internal bleeding in the animal's organs. 
But the big mystery is how these normally harmless bacteria became lethal pathogens. And the animals were very stressed. They lost their coat, they don't have their winter coat. So the stress, in combination with exposure to bacteria or the presence of bacteria, leads to the invasion of the bacteria into the body and rapid death. Per acute, five hours, you know, 12 hours. Death. There have often been mass mortalities among saiga antelopes, but never of such magnitude. Why did all the infected animals die? And how could the disease break out in different places at once? The expedition aims to shed light on those questions. But first, the researchers have to find the animals. A meeting with rangers. They're supposed to lead the scientists to the saigas. The problem is that the only two animals with radio collars have moved away from the herd. They said the saiga aren't here anymore, that there are only small groups left. You can see them, but not get near them. The next day, something happens that no one had expected anymore. The ghosts of the steppe are there. The expedition has achieved its aim. Oh, wow. yeah. The animals have gathered a thousand kilometers deep in the steppe to bear their young. It's the calving season, the only time when the scientists can approach the shy animals. Most of the calves are already on their legs. Are the animals healthy? To find out, the calves are examined. Now the scientists can start the real work. That includes weighing and measuring the calves. We want to carry out conventional monitoring on the state of the calves. In other words, to find out how many there are, the density of the calf population, and the size of a litter, in order to see how reproduction is going. A tissue sample should show whether there are passerella bacteria in the calves' bodies. The usually harmless bacteria that became lethal pathogens last year, killing the animals. Despite the extreme environment, poaching, and mass mortality, Kazakhstan's primordial animal has survived for millennia. But conservationists are worried that another mass die-off could be the last. Yeah, so very concerning. And it just shows you how much pathogens can infect entire populations of animals. I know that for us, COVID-19 is a very new thing, a very new concerning and devastating um, pandemic that is has hit our society and unfortunately affected many of our loved ones. But at the same time, as pathogens have been decimating animal populations for untold amounts of times. There's other examples too. There's a virus in the cheetah populations that's been affecting their population numbers. And since all cheetahs are basically clones of each other, it's, all, it's a virus that's deadly to almost all of them. And we also have, we had a virus in uh, papayas that almost wiped out the papaya population, but then we genetically modified them to make them resistant to the virus. So yeah, um, hope you guys found that video interesting. So now we're gonna talk about a type of a population growth curve called exponential growth. And an exponential growth curve, I do want to make it clear, exponential growth curve only occurs in, a, in either a computer model or in our minds. So exponential growth curve. Now, exponential growth is numbers that keep on doubling until it just turn, turns into a straight line, as in it is, it is going to increase at the maximum rate possible. And we also call an exponential growth curve, and I know I said earlier we wouldn't be talking about this, but I guess we are. We also call it biotic potential. Biotic is life, potential is the ability to achieve. And with an exponential growth curve, the reason why it can't really exist is because it includes the presence of what we call environmental resistance factors. Well, actually not what we call, I just talked about them. Come on, teacher environmental resistance factors. So it is without. So this is without the presence of environmental resistance factors. Without. How would the population grow? Well, it depends. One of the biggest things that it depends on is that the 
growth rate depends on how fast a species can reproduce. It isn't just about the absence of, re of resistance factors. It's also things like how fast can this can this, the species re reproduce? How many young are born at one time? And we generally class these into one of two categories. There's more categories, but in this class, we keep it simple. And the first is what we call an R curve. And the second is what we call a K curve. Now, when we say that a that a, a, a species is an R, um, another term, term we use for that is R selective. What this means is it is a, a species that is small in size, matures early, and bears their offspring externally. So external offspring. The reason why is, is our selected species can reproduce so fast is, is because they bear their young normally through external eggs. And their, their strategy is to hatch as many young as possible because they expect about 99% of them to die. Yes, yeah, so when you see a bunch of spiders burst out of a spider egg, it isn't that they're all going to go and, and meet and find their place in society. Instead, most of them are going to die. They're either going to be unable to find food, they're going to get crushed, they're going to get eaten. And the reason why they, they reproduce in such large numbers is because they expect most of them to die. That's, that's why they're able to uh, survive. And mainly these are things like insects and, and other small animals um, uh, that we consider to be our selected. Now, if there are no environmental resistance factors, you can imagine how fast they're going to become exponential. Because if you have a, a close to 100% survival rate, the, the their ability to um, uh, reproduce would be overwhelming. Species that are, are selected tend to be ones that you would need to call the pest control person over. Uh, these are ones that can become invasive really fast. Probably have not had to call up Terminex for a donkey infestation anytime soon, but things like ants, things like flies, things like termites, beetles, if you live in the Midwest, yes, that's a thing. Um, so it's, it's things that can reproduce really fast. Case selected is a lot different because case selected normally refers to mammals and these are large in size, late maturity, and they bear their offspring internally, internal um, offspring. I know it's not the correct term, but because of this is that it takes them longer in their lifespan to reproduce. When they do, um, uh, their offspring must be born internally, meaning that they can only carry a couple at a time. And, and it takes time for the offspring to, to develop in, in the mother's, um, uh, re re reproductive system. And the reason why they don't grow exponentially is that, is that the birth rates usually just slightly exceed the death rates. Because if you have elephants, for example, if an elephant has birth um, two or three times in its lifetime, then um, you aren't going to have your, uh, the, the elephant population isn't, isn't going to grow too fast. 
So with a, a case-selected species, even without environmental resistance factors, that's not always a guarantee that they are going to, um, that they are going to um, uh, grow in, in a, at a very high rate. Here's a video if you want to see it quickly. It is a video of what sand crabs look like after they're hatched. Just to show you how with our selected species, just how quickly they can um, reproduce. And in just such dramatic numbers. I think you get the idea, but yes, definitely are selected. All right, so that's all fine and good. But as I said, is a graph like this, all it is really good for showing you is how fast the population can increase in numbers if there's nothing limiting their growth. And even though R and case, case selected are the two categories we have here, most species are somewhere in between. For example, cats. Cats are not quite case selected, but they're definitely not R selected. However, they can still have pretty large, large litter sizes. So sometimes they're just somewhere in the middle, somewhere in between the poles. Okay, cool. Now, Really, how population growth goes is through something called logistical growth. And this is a real growth curve. And that's because is this growth curve, unlike the other one, includes environmental resistance factors, ERFs, I'll just, I'll just call them. Now, there's always going to be a line here that we call K. And the K is the carrying capacity. That's what it means, carrying capacity. Well, let me go ahead and uh, label this here. So the y-axis is going to be population size. X is going to be time. Now this line here, the carrying capacity line called K, it is not a set number because as the environmental resistance factors change, the carrying capacity changes. If there's fewer environmental resistance factors, the carrying capacity will go up, so the line will get higher. If there's more environmental resistance factors then K will go down because the, the population will have to be smaller. So we always have a line here called K. Now with a population, when it first begins to grow, it's going to begin to grow very fast like this. And we call this point here, the rate of exponential growth. But then we see that as time goes on, we see that growth is going to begin to level off. And this is called the rate of logistical growth. So here in blue is the period, I shouldn't say um, rate, 
Um, uh, so blue is the rate of exponential growth and pink is the rate of logistical growth because the closer a population gets to its carrying capacity, then the, the slower its growth is going to be. Now, on occasion, if a, if a species grows very fast, it can actually exceed its carrying, its carrying capacity. So it can grow like this. Now, the problem with this is if a population grows too fast, like if it is an R selected species, because it can grow so fast, it can exceed its carrying capacity. This isn't good for the species because now their numbers have exceeded the resources available that can support them. So the population is going to go back down at a similar um, uh, amount as it exceeded. So we call this a population overshoot when it exceeds its carrying capacity. And we call this a dieback when it falls back down. But, but don't worry, it's going to go through another period here called oscillation, where it's going to slowly exceed its carrying capacity, then, then uh, dip, exceed, decrease, until it levels off. And we call this oscillation. So populations that grow very fast, they're going to first overshoot their carrying, their carrying capacity. Then they're going to die back. And then you're going to have these smaller periods of overshoot and die back until you reach an even number, until it becomes even. That's also why it's so bad when humans impact forests, for example, because several species, they've, it's taken them generations to find this, this perfect set point. And when you tamper with the environment, you, you tamper with the resistance factors um, that each, each species faces. All right, now I have on here a graph on the outline, a section for a predator prey graph. Uh, we're going to hold off on that for now. I don't know why I put that on exactly, but we're going to hold off on that, that for that for now. Okay, next we're going to talk about population density. And population density. is number of organisms in an area. It's measured by, did I put down destiny? Of course I did, population density. It's measured in organisms over um, area. Now this is not a mathematical equation, but basically what it's saying is that the more animals are in an area, the more dense the, the population is. And when populations are more dense, it generally is not good for the population as a whole. Any kind of factor that limits um, uh, population growth is, well there's, well, there's two. There are two kinds of factors that oppose a population growth. And the first one is called a density dependent factor, so density de dependent. What this term means is that these are biotic factors, meaning factors related to life that limit population growth. So basically what this means is that the reason why population growth slows down is because of of uh well actually let me just tell you the terms and then we'll and then it will make make sense so things like food availability the more organisms that are present the less food things like um, habitat availability 
things like water, things like mates, and even things like disease. These are all controlled or, or these are all, 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 these are all, all influenced by how dense the population is. Now, these are density, next are density independent factors. And density independent, these do not depend on how dense the population is. So these are any factors that oppose population growth regardless of its size. And these are things like temperature, um, well, actually, let me just let me just make it simple. These are things like weather or adverse weather. Droughts. Um, things that well, actually water would probably probably fit in this better. Adverse weather, droughts, natural disasters. So these are all things that it doesn't matter if the population size is one or one million. Adverse weather is going to, going to affect survival. Droughts going to affect survival. Natural disasters are going to affect sur survival. So these are things that these are factors that are going to affect populations, population size, but it doesn't matter how many or what size the, the population is. Density dependent though does, because these are things that the reason why population is limited is because of resources that, that need to be available for all the organisms present. So when we say food availability, of course, the smaller the population, the more, more food there would be. The smaller the population, the more habitats there would be. The smaller the population, the more water, more mates, less disease. All right, so this ends chapter 19. I hope you all enjoyed the lecture and the video. And we'll see you again for the next one. Over and out.